morning. I uh, heard that I missed worship kazoos yesterday or last week. Um, I was out of town visiting my mom. Uh, she had knee surgery, and I got to play nurse, and I am very happy to not be a nurse. I don't want to do that anymore. I've already decided. Um, I was, this is coincidence, I promise. I didn't plan my mom's knee surgery for this, but I got to be in the path of totality of the eclipse. So I snuck out onto the front yard and took that picture. That's my picture I did. It's not great, but it's proof I was there. Uh, Coolest thing I ever saw. If you can ever go somewhere uh, to see the sun disappear behind the moon for four minutes, uh, go for it. Uh, My mom's house is full of knickknacks. Is your mom's house full of knickknacks? My mom's house is full of knickknacks. They're everywhere. She's got paintings all over the place, decorations. Every horizontal surface has something on it. And I was really interested. I'm literally typing my sermon for Sunday, and I look around, and the word faith is everywhere on these decorations, all over the place. Um, One of the little painting things said, faith family and uh, friends was what one of them said. Just a little, you know, poster of it. Um, another one had, uh, had kind of a quote from the book of Hebrews. It was faith, hope, and love. That's, you know, a pretty rough uh, quote from the, actually the book that we're going to study today. Um, one said, faith, believe, and dream, which I thought was kind of, I don't really, that's sort of generic words that didn't have much connection to um, anything. But I thought it was interesting because none of them, well, there's one that had like some Bible verses, but they were real, real small in the painting, but they didn't really say very much. They just had these words written on posters and none of them, I checked, I looked in every room of the house, none of them used Brian Beck's definition of faith from last week. So Brian, maybe that's like a money-making opportunity for you that you can start writing that saying and selling it to my mom. I think that she would probably buy one. Uh, The definition from last week was, and I loved it, was faith is confidence that God is and that he will do what he promised to do. That's what we're going to talk about again uh, this week. You know, I wondered if, if you were just to look around my mom's house. Now, my, you know, I'm, I'm not picking on my mom. She's probably listening online and rolling her eyes right now. But if, I, if you were to walk around her house and just see posters that said the word faith, I don't know that you would really get the definition of faith that Brian gave us last week. Like it doesn't ever expand on what the definition is or who do we have faith in or what does that word mean. Um, Maybe somebody, like some of us who grew up in the church would get the reference faith, hope, and love. Like that would ring a bell. Oh, that's from the Bible, right? But I don't know that most people just walking into my mom's house would understand what faith means, what it is that we are asked to have faith in. It almost seemed like a, like a little catchphrase, something that we say without really thinking very much. You just have faith. Uh, you'll say it to somebody who's, you know, struggling or going through a hard time. But I don't think I've ever once said, hey, have faith. And by that, I mean have confidence that God is and that he will do what he promised to do. We leave off the whole definition of what the word means a lot. I think probably most of the time it, we say faith, but we really mean hope. If I'm telling someone that's struggling with sickness, hey, have faith, I'm really saying I hope you get better. Uh, so we mix that word around a lot, and we're going to talk about what, what's the Bible's definition of faith. That's the one that I think uh, really matters. I don't think that a generic hoping is enough. I don't think that's what the Bible means when it talks about faith. Now, again, I'm not criticizing my mom and her decorations. I don't think that the posters we put on, on, on our, the walls of our home need to be biblical definitions of the various words. I'm not saying that that... But in our hearts, well, we better understand what faith is. That better be something that we are 100% clear about. And the Bible gives us all kinds of definitions. John, where are you at? You set me up great for my sermon today. John Pugh read uh, tons of the backstory of Abraham that we don't have time to talk about today. So I'm glad that you did that today. Um, Hebrews 11 is where we're going to focus. You want to open up your Bibles there. I realized I have a slightly different version that I read from than what's in your pews, but it'll be pretty close. Um, Hebrews 11 is an interesting chapter because it lists a whole bunch of characters from the Bible, mostly Old Testament characters, 
And it talks about why they are examples for us to follow. Like we are to imitate these people. So I'm going to read the little chunk that we're going to talk about from a about Abraham today. That's where we're going to focus. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but uh, we'll be able to handle it. Hebrews 11 chapter 8 says this. By faith, Abraham, when called to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, him who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Now, if you just hop right in, and Hebrews 11 is the first passage you've ever read out of the Bible, we just got... We, the, it names tons of people from the Old Testament. It doesn't explain who they are, why they're important in the faith. So Hebrews 11 is one of those chapters where we, we have to go back and read the whole story about Abraham. Uh, Hebrews was written to who? Did anybody know? The Hebrews, right? The Hebrews didn't need the summary of who Abraham was. They heard the name and they knew exactly who you're talking about. They knew every single story about him. We might need a little refresher on who Abraham was. Who is this lady, Sarah? Who is Isaac and Jacob? It's really interesting. Abraham gets mentioned in the New Testament a lot. He's not a perfect guy, but there is a lot that we can learn from him. Uh, Genesis 11 actually is the very, very, very first mention of Abraham, and it just mentions that he existed. Uh, Abraham was alive, and so was his wife, Sarah. And then right away in chapter 12, this is the next thing that happens in the life of Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, so Abraham existed and boom, God is talking to him. Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. That's what the book of Hebrews is referring to, that God said, hey, I want you to go somewhere, I'm not telling you where, and then the next verse says, Abraham went. God asked Abram, that was his original name, I'm going to switch Abram and Abraham all kinds of times because it's hard to keep them all straight, but the same guy, and um, he asked him to move to a foreign country. He says, leave everything that you have ever known. Uh, I want you to leave your people behind, everything that you grew up with, and he promises that everyone, and you and I are included in that everyone, everyone will be blessed through him. And Abraham went. And that's the faith that Hebrews, the passage that we read earlier, is talking about. God said, Abraham, I want you to go. And Abraham went and didn't ask a whole lot of questions. That last part is really interesting to me. Abraham obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. God did not provide him the GPS, of, GPS coordinates of the promised land. He didn't even print off MapQuest for him. He said, go to Abraham, and Abraham went. He didn't promise that there's going to be plenty of food to eat. He didn't, uh, he didn't tell him if there were foreigners in the land that weren't really excited about him moving in. He didn't mention if everyone was friendly or not. They did, he didn't say anything about how they were going to treat him. He didn't say how long the trip was. He didn't mention if everyone in his family would survive the journey. Abraham didn't even know what the weather was going to be like when he got there. And Abraham went. He is considered faithful because he obeyed. God said something and he did it. Now, every single married couple that's ever existed is makes up of two people. You've got somebody who is spontaneous and somebody who is a planner. Am I correct, married couples? There's always person in the room that is spontaneous, Heidi Rodert, and there's somebody who is not, Brian Rodert. And because God likes to stretch us, he puts the planner and the spontaneous person in a marriage and says, good luck with that, right? Now, at first, the differences draw your attention. I met Heidi, and I thought, oh, my goodness, she's so spontaneous. Look at how she just runs around all the time without planning things. No plan, no map. Let's just go somewhere fun and see what happens, right? At first, it's cute and appealing. 
But after a while, the panic starts to set in. Oh my word, she never knows what's going to happen next. I like to have a plan. I like to have an agenda. I at least like to have a destination of where I'm going. So if I was Abram and God said, I want you to go somewhere and I'm not going to tell you where to go, he hands you a map and all it has is a giant question mark on it and just it's in here somewhere. That would be really, really tough for me. How about you? The spontaneous in the room are like, ooh, an adventure, but the planners are panicking. Now, granted, I did think about this. The God of the universe did speak to him. I think that changes the conversation a little bit, right? If Heidi says, hey, I want to go somewhere and I'm not going to tell you where, I'm a little nervous. But if God came to me and said the exact same thing, well, that's a different conversation. But the difficulty in obeying is still there. And Abraham's obedience is what made him faithful. God said, go, and he did. Move on down the passage in Hebrews 11. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. So the writer of Hebrews goes on and says, here's another reason why Abraham is faithful. He moved into the promised land. He lived in a tent and he didn't go anywhere. He said, that's where I'm going to live from now on. My little sister, Lauren, she called me a couple weeks ago. And she asked me if I wanted the pop-up camper that she got from my grandma and grandpa. <laughs> to be honest, I don't, I don't remember how she got it. I really did think about it like, I, I mean, my grandparents have been gone for a while. And I don't know how she got this camper to Iowa where she lives. But she and her husband got it. They fixed it up. I personally have spent many camping trips as a child in this camper that I'm about to inherit from my little sister. So this thing has seen miles and miles and miles. Camping is fun, right, Jess? No, not fun. <laughs> uh, camping is good for us because it gets rid of the comforts of regular life and it reduces everything down to the essentials. It's fun to live more simply than we normally do, to get rid of the electricity and all the things that make us comfortable in our home homes. It might be a little worse on our back. It's guaranteed to rain and make everything a muddy mess, but it is good for us to move our lives at a different pace than what it normally moves at. But every camping trip comes to an end. There comes a point where your back says, no more. I want you to go home and sleep in your regular bed. There comes a point where you are tired of cooking for your family on a tiny little camp stove. And, be, and the reason is because we do not live in campers. We don't live in tents. They aren't designed to keep us out of the elements for years and years and years on end. There's nothing permanent about a camper. They're fun to stay in, but they're not fun to live in. Where did Abraham stay when he got to the promised land? In a tent. He did not live in a permanent house. And not only him, but Isaac and Jacob did the same thing. Now, once again, the writer of the book of Hebrews doesn't tell us who Isaac and Jacob is, so I'm going to tell you who. Those are down the line in the genealogy from Abraham. It goes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph's next. And he says those guys did the exact same thing. They lived like foreigners in a foreign country because they were faithful to God. Now, God made a promise to Abraham. This is what uh, uh, John read earlier, that the whole world would be blessed through him, Abram, and his offspring. Do you guys remember the little detail about Abraham and Sarah that we learned about? They were childless. It is very difficult to bless people through your offspring if you don't have any. So when Abraham and Sarah got that promise from God, I cannot imagine what went through their minds. Pardon me? They were super old when they got this promise, way past the age when people have children. Making a promise to a couple who is childless that you're going to bless people through their offspring seems foolish. But Abraham believed, and he had Isaac. Well, Sarah had Isaac. Isaac ended up having Jacob. Jacob ended up having Joseph. It's almost as if the author of Hebrews is just mapping out. Look at what God did. It started with him, and it went to him, and it went to him, and people were faithful all the way down the line. 
The chain continues on past Abraham and his wife, and God's blessings make their way to little old Brian Rotard in Rockford, Illinois. Do you all know how God blessed all of us through Abraham? Do you know the story? Verse 10. For he, Abram, was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Verse 10 draws a beautiful contrast between what Abram was living in, which was a tent, something temporary, and talks about how we're looking forward to living somewhere else. Where did Abraham want to live? A city with foundations. It wasn't because Abraham was a city boy and he just wanted to live in a city. It says, the city with foundations. Most cities have foundations in them, right? Anyone want to guess which city we are talking about? What? Heaven. The city. The place where we all want to go because it has foundations. When I take my grandparents' old pop-up camper out, please let it not be rusty. I'm not going to spend time and money to lay a foundation at the campsite where, when I arrive, correct? When I turn in for the night, I'm not going to be busy pouring concrete to put underneath the pop-up camper. You all know what they're like. They sit on two wheels. There's four tiny, tiny little pegs that stick out and touch the ground. And somehow we think they're not going to wobble at all, right? The only thing from keeping... Brian and Heidi from rolling onto the side is four little legs. But if I want to build a house that's going to last, then I'm going to take the time and the expense to build a great big thick foundation so that the house that I live in is going to stand firm. I lay the foundation so it lasts a really long time. And I love the picture that the author of Hebrews draws. Can you picture God as an architect of a city? He's got great big giant blueprints all rolled out. And he says, ooh, I'm going to make the best city you ever did see. He's been planning out just the perfect place for you and for me. The place that he's building is perfect in every way. It's not just a nice place to live. It's not just full of stable foundations with beautiful homes. It's that this place, this city where God is building, literally solves every problem you and I have ever experienced in our lives. His, in his kingdom, there is no more pain. His buildings are so perfect, we can't hurt anymore. There's no more suffering. God has constructed this city that he's preparing for us in such a way that death itself is a memory that we will barely remember anymore. Can you imagine a city that good? In this city, the city that he is building is stable. This is a city with foundations. It's not going anywhere rock hard foundations. It's nothing like the houses that we live in now. In comparison to the, that city, the houses we live in are like tents, temporary places that, will, that hurt our backs. And we think, man, why did I ever live there? That's the city that he is preparing for us. And those of us who join God in this heavenly city will laugh at what used to be called our big strong house that lasted hundreds of years. We're all going to live together and we're going to marvel at the architect and builder of this place where we get to spend eternity. Y'all want to go there? I've been in Texas. I said, y'all. <laughs> it just slips out. I don't know. Not only do we get to hang out and be present in this city, but God, the architect, the builder of this city is going to hang out with us. He who have, he created us as well is going to be joining us for dinner, walking down the streets with us. Our creator is going to know us and we will know him. And for the first time in our lives, we will be 100% known and completely unashamed. For the first time in our lives, we can discover who we are, who we were created to be, what we were created to do. For the first time in our lives, we'll be able to live completely unafraid, knowing the foundations of this city that God has made for us are strong, strong enough to last for eternity. And that's the place that Abraham was looking forward to going. And the blessing that Abraham got, you're going to be with me there someday, goes all the way down to us. Does that sound like the kind of place that you want to live? Does that sound better than living in a tent or your grandparents' old pop-up camper? Yes, 
Does that sound like a place where we want our family members to be at, where we want our friends to be at, where we want our one person that is written on the board to be at with us? And if we're faithful the way that Abraham was faithful, if we believe God's promises, that is exactly what is waiting for us. If we're faithful the way Abraham was, and we are obedient to what God asks us to do, even when it doesn't make sense for us to be obedient, then that's the city that will be waiting for us. Verse 11, by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. I'm happy Sarah gets a mention in this. She was faithful too. Sarah was dealing with the pain of infertility. I bet more than Abraham was dealing with that pain. Most of us probably know someone who has struggled with that, who wanted nothing more to bring a baby into the world and love it to pieces, and for whatever reason, it doesn't happen. It's incredibly painful to go through. It was an act of faith for Sarah to believe God, even though it was decades past when people have children. But Abraham's, couldn't, Abraham's heirs can't be a blessing to all nations if Sarah doesn't believe too. Sarah's summary is different than Abraham's summing. Did you catch it? Sarah is faithful, not because of her obedience, though she was. Sarah's faithful because she believed God would keep his promises. She, actually, she believed that God is faithful to keep his promise. They're both faithful. God and Sarah are both faithful, and Sarah believes it. Sarah looked at the God who made the promise and said, yep, I'm going to believe that guy. And therefore, she is considered faithful. Go back to Brian's definition. Faith is confidence that God is, I believe that he exists, and that he's going to do what he promised to do. One more verse, verse 12. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. As I get older, I don't love the description of Abraham that says he's as good as dead. (laughs) It's maybe a little insensitive, right? But Abraham was an old guy. What they're actually saying is he was as good as dead because his reproductive years were over. Abraham was not going to have any more kids. They're both way past childbearing years. So I think probably to our modern ears, maybe that phrase stings a little more than it's really supposed to. But from that one man who was way too old to have kids, God brought forth an incredible amount of descendants. The photo behind me is from the Hubble telescope. It's actually kind of an older photo. Uh, Compared to the, uh, what is it, the James Webb telescope? I mean, this is like child's play. This is a Fisher-Price telescope. But I have always loved this shot. Do you know the story behind this? Smart astronomy people, NASA scientists, I don't know who did, pointed the Hubble telescope at a spot in the sky where there's nothing. Did you, have you heard this before? And the spot at the sky that they pointed it at is equivalent to a grain of sand held at arm's length. Everybody hold a grain of sand in your hand. Hold it at arm's length. Come on. Grain of sand at arm's length. And that is how much of the sky we are looking at in that picture. And they thought that that grain of sand was pretty empty. Like, well, that's weird. Kind of a, you know, a weird coincidence that there was a dark patch of the sky and there's nothing there. So they pointed the telescope at that grain of sand, opened up the lens, and just let it absorb all the light that hit it. And that's what they, well, that's not what they found. (laughs) Where'd the stars go? Were they there? Okay, well, you saw the stars. They, They didn't just find stars. They found galaxies that they didn't know existed in this tiny grain of sand that they thought nothing ever existed at. Isn't that crazy? I, th- I, I should have been a scientist. I don't know. I thought that was amazing. It gives me the impression that we are not done counting the stars yet. And Abraham's descendants are more numerous than that tiny patch of sky that's the size of a grain of sand. You know what makes that statement true? How, how is it that Abraham's descendants are that numerous? He didn't have that many kids. The first is kind of a biological explanation. 
If you go to the very first chapter of the book of Matthew and you read the genealogy of Jesus, it starts with who? Anybody know? Uh uh-uh. Abraham. It starts with Abraham and ends with who? Jesus. The, Matthew is a scholar, the author of the, the book of Matthew. He is a scholar and he maps it all out. If you start with Abraham, you go to Isaac, then you go to Jacob, then you go to Joseph, and da 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 you get all the way to Jesus. Is Jesus a blessing to us? Yeah. So through Abraham's offspring times that many generations, everybody in the whole world, me and you included, gets to be blessed. That's good. All nations on earth are blessed by Jesus because Abraham and Sarah had faith that God would do what he said he was going to do. That's a big blessing, isn't it? The second way is a little more spiritual. The book of Galatians, so that's the letter that Paul wrote to this church in Galatia. He says it this way, understand then that those who have faith, is that me and you? are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles. Who's a Gentile? Everybody. Who's a Gentile? By faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. That, that what God said to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed by you, that is good news because the, the blessing is who? Jesus. So if I have faith, even though I'm a Gentile and I have no family relation to Jesus or Abraham or anybody else, the book of Galatians says, ah, ah, yes, you do. Because my faith can be like Abraham's faith. I can believe that God will keep his promises just like Abraham did. When we have faith, we have confidence that God is and that he is going to do what he promised. We get to be grafted in to this giant family of God. And that family of God is too numerous to count. It's like pointing the Hubble at a patch of space that has nothing in it. That faith that we have, as feeble as it is, is your faith feeble like mine sometimes? That faith that we have makes us a part of this kingdom that God has created that has beautiful foundations that are going to last for all of eternity. It's going to be so wonderful that we'll laugh at the tents that we live in right now. And when we have faith that God will keep his promises, we get to be called his children. I wrote down four promises that, I, that God made to you that you just have to believe that he's going to keep them. God promised that he would forgive our sins if we believe in his son. Is that a good promise? As in Romans 1. God promised that ultimately, maybe not here where I'm still living in a tent, but ultimately, everything will work out for the good of those who love him. Is that a good promise? 2 Corinthians says that God promised to comfort us when we go through hard times. Is that a promise we need to believe in? Philippians 1. God promised to keep working in us forever until we look like his son. Until the sin has been purged from our bodies, until People look at us and only see Jesus. God promised that he's going to keep doing that. Is that a good promise? I don't look like him yet. I'm still working on it. So church, the the hard part is, is what we're all called to do is believe. We're not talking about a have faith like just a generic saying on a poster on a wall. We're talking about the, the kind of faith that makes me obey The kind of faith that makes me respond and say, okay, God, like, I don't love having a map with a question mark on it, but I'm going to go because you told me to. The kind of faith that knows that it's time to open my mouth and tell my friend about Jesus, so I just do it. 
I take a step even though I'm scared and have no idea what I'm going to do. The kind of faith that gives when it doesn't make sense, but you just know God is saying, do it. We have to have that kind of faith. We pray with me. Father, the bar is high. And I know that uh, we fall short sometimes. It is hard for us to believe. It is hard for our belief to be translated into obedience, where we just do what it is that you're asking us to do. So, Father, we're asking you to help us. We know that you have asked us to tell you when we need help, and we need it. God, I don't know what the people that are here this morning listening are dealing with. I don't know what uh, the task is that you've laid before him that you're asking us to have faith about. Uh, but, Father, we ask for more faith that we can believe things that are 100% impossible for, you know, biology or for just the world that we live in. God, we know that you uh, work miracles even today and you cause things to be possible that are impossible. So, God, give us that kind of faith, the kind of faith that Abraham and Sarah had, the kind of faith that is risky and dangerous and doesn't make sense to the people that are watching that don't know what the Holy Spirit is. Father, we thank you for being good, for your forgiveness that covers us when we fall short. Father, we're so thankful for the great, 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 great son, grandson of Abraham, Jesus. Because of Abraham and Sarah's faith, we get to be called clean in your sight. I pray in your son's name. Amen.